Okay. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Eva Degostini. Um, I'm a school psychologist at Riverside School Board and I have been for many, many years, but right now I'm working with all of the 10 English school boards of Quebec through the Centre of Excellence for Behaviour Management. Um, so it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Now, some people might say, wait a minute, but we're dealing with K4 or K5. We're dealing with the little ones. You know, why, why are we talking about their behavior already? And I'm not wanting to diagnose them at all. But one of the things that I've learned over the years, because I've been in this area of school psychology for a long time, and one of the things that I have, uh, I've learned over the years is that if we um, don't understand what's happening with our little ones. Sometimes our interventions can actually cause more problems. Some of the children who are going to come to you already have a lot of things going on in their life and that will cause um, some concerns and, and, and you'll see some behaviors that are going to be more than what is typical for a child of their age. But some of the behaviors that we see are quite typical for a child of that age. And I think it's really important for us to understand what we are actually dealing with. And so um, the, the, the um, session that I'm doing is, is based on the book uh, um, by Dr. Deborah McNamara called Rest, Play, Grow. Um, and her, her title of her book is Making Sense of Preschoolers or, or Anyone Who Acts Like One. Uh, because just because you've gotten older doesn't mean that you've gotten wiser. So it's possible that some of you might recognize even adults that you know who have a, perf a personality profile that is similar to our preschoolers. And she is a, um, a faculty member of the Newfeld Institute and bases her work on the work of Dr. Gordon Newfeld. And that is basically the, the person whose work I use as well to um, to anchor the knowledge that I've gotten over the years of working uh, with children. I also um, am very interested in neuroscience and understanding how the brain develops. Um, and so we'll be bringing in a little bit of that in as well. And that also is all part of both Dr. Neufeld's paradigm and Dr. McNamara's understanding of, of how to understand our little guys. Um, I love her book because what she says is that it's really about taking care of young children as they are egocentric, impulsive, inconsiderate, delightful, curious, joyful. And really, we have to truly understand that immaturity is not a mistake, but the humble beginning from which we all start. I'm going to be describing some behaviors that are typical of four-year-olds and five-year-olds and even some of our six-year-olds, but those behaviors are not there because someone has made a mistake. Those behaviors are there for a very good developmental reason and we have to sort of be able to hang in there with them until things start to grow and develop. And as some of you know, um, when when the growth and the development and the maturation happens, there's also some stuff that's lost. And especially around this time of Christmas, um, you know, the, the magic of Christmas is particularly there with our little four-year-olds. You know, they, they see the magic, our four-year-olds and our five-year-olds. Um, when children get to be six or seven, a little bit of that magic gets lost. And so um, development, while it's absolutely wonderful, can also has a little bit of a price there as well. When we look at the developmental approach, we're really looking at three big keys. We're looking at maturation and understanding how human beings grow and mature. And one of the things that we've learned is over the years is that it isn't a process that it, it's a process that takes a long, long time. Um, the brain science now is telling us that our brain isn't stabilized in its development until well into the mid 20s and probably into uh, into the early 30s. So maturation takes a long time and we need to respect and understand that. We also need to understand that in order to grow, you have to be soft. But softness is really hard because when you're soft, you're vulnerable. And so we need also need to understand vulnerability and where vulnerability comes from uh, and what it is that affects our children. And some of our children are highly sensitive, children in the autism spectrum, uh, children with certain syndromes come to us with high sensitivity and they have a lot of vulnerability and it, they're, the fact that they're coping with, with a world that is really hard for them to manage means they're gonna have areas of their life that aren't maturing as they should because when you put that shell on, the shell affects the maturation and the neuroscience is now showing that to us. And all of us as human beings are all struggling with how do we stay vulnerable and soft so that we can become who we're meant to be. And right now uh, in this era of COVID, we are feeling some of us very vulnerable and feeling how that shell we sometimes are putting on ourselves uh, to cope with something that's making us feel very vulnerable. And how do we get 
through and how do we handle vulnerability? Well, it's through attachment. If you have an attachment with a caring person, they can shield you and keep you soft so that you can continue to grow and develop. And of course, one of the reasons why we have brought our little four-year-olds into school is because we're aware that in some homes, the adults are not necessarily able to give a child everything that they need in order to create the conditions for growth and development. And it isn't about giving them more books or giving them, you know, more things to play with or more toys. It's really about giving them a safe attachment. And we know that some families sadly struggle with that. So when we are dealing with our young children, um, we need really to, to understand what's happening with them. This is one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Neufeld. Just as you cannot train a caterpillar to become a butterfly, you cannot train a preschooler to become an adult. And if we think about some of the things that we want our preschoolers to do, and I'm not talking about academics, I'm talking about some of the behaviors that we want them to do, to be kind, to be considerate, to think of other people, to just, you know, so many things that we want them to do they're just not capable of doing that. And we need to respect and understand that. So we have to be very careful uh, about some of the demands we are putting and expectations we're putting on our very young children. The neuroscience, we now can look into a functioning human brain. In the, this is a two-day-old baby um, at St. Justin Hospital. The grandmother was the researcher. She convinced her daughter to let her Put these little electrodes on the baby's brain and I think there were about four or five other mothers that allowed them to do and what they found was that the one day old baby when the when the mother spoke the language part of the brain the left hemisphere lit up but when the nurse spoke to the baby it was the voice recognition part of the brain now I don't know how the researcher interpreted that she was just wanting to see is the baby already wired for language? Absolutely, the baby is already wired for language. But what's fascinating here is not only is the baby wired for language, but the baby's brain is wired to work most efficiently in the context of attachment because the baby had already heard the mother's voice from very early on. The more attached we are to people, the better our brain can function. Um, and so, and so this, we now know this about our human brain and we, we are a little bit slow in education to truly understand the developmental implications of that. So Dr. McNamara has created what she calls a preschooler profile. And I'm going to go through each of these very, very quickly. She has a chapter on each of these in her book. Um, but basically, preschoolers need to emerge. They have a lack of mixed feelings. They have lots of counter will. They are prone to aggression. Uh, they need their tears of futility. They desperately need connection and they desperately need play. So what do we mean by a need to emerge? Well, this is of course what every one of us holds dearly in our heart for our little ones. We know that they are going to they, we want them to develop. We want to create an environment in our classrooms where that all that lovely human development is going to happen. But what we need to remember is that it doesn't happen because we force it. No more than a plant would grow if we pulled on it can a child grow if we try and force them to do that. It really growth happens when rest is there. So one of the challenges we have um, is that if we have a large group of children, it can be a pretty kind of crazy place, but if children trust the adult or the adults who are there taking care of them, they can rest in that relationship. And when they rest in that relationship, then their brain continues to grow and develop. And we know that this growth and development and emergence is happening when they want to venture forth from the source of attachment. And you see that with some of the children, you know, they basically, they need a hug from you at the beginning of the day. And again, I know at COVID times, it's hard to give the hug, but they need that reassurance. And away they go and they start exploring their world. Um, they are able to pay attention to that which is new and unknown. Basically, they're curious. They're really curious. They want to become autonomous and independent. Um, one of the research, a lot of research has looked at autonomy and independence, and one of the things that they found, parents who pick their children up when they ask to be picked up and pick them up and carry them for a bit have children who basically want to be put down and walk on their own. When you have a young child who, who wants to be picked up and the parents are constantly saying, no, honey, you can walk on your own, they continue the whining and wanting to be picked up a whole lot longer. It seems counterintuitive, but the research, all sorts of research is showing us is that when attachment needs are met, the desire to become independent is there. And the desire to become distinct and unique and figure out who you are, to be the origin of what they think can do. And of course, this can be quite challenging sometimes because sometimes you, that you will say something to 
to them and and they'll say this is this is red and you go no honey that's actually pink no it's not it's red oh boy you're not going to change their mind because they want to tell you what color this thing is even if they don't know what the actual answer is in the emergence the true self is born they're starting to figure out who they are who they want to be and of course we usually delight in that uh, as much as possible. How do we foster emergence? Well, it's actually by fulfilling attachment hunger, by providing more than what is being sought. Attachment is actually like, like uh, hunger, and and it's attachment hunger. So when we take care of the dependency needs, then the children will actually often say, and again, many of you have had these experiences, but you didn't quite know what to do with them perhaps, is that you go to help one child, one child says, Miss, could you help me you know, tie my shoes? And so you go down and you help them tie their shoes, you know, and then, um, and 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 so, so then, so, and other times you go to help a child and say, no, I don't need help right now, and they clearly need help. But if, if you've been caring for children all along, they are willing to take care of themselves. Where we get hung up is a child who continually begs us to take care of them. And of course, what that says to me now is that this is a, probably a child whose parents are having a hard time meeting their dependency needs. And very often, this will happen, especially for four-year-olds, right around the time that mommy and daddy have a new baby. And there's a new baby in the house, and now they become more whiny and dependent because they, perhaps some of their needs are not, are not being taken care of as much because of the baby there. We also need to create a vacuum. We need to let the child figure out what they want to do. Uh, and again, many of you do that quite naturally by providing all sorts of play opportunities for children because it is through play that children can figure out who, that, who they are. Play, of course, we have to be very careful about play. We have to remember it's but moving or operating freely in a bounded space. And bounded is important. So in the classroom, it's not a free for all when you have free play, as you well know, but it's a place where the adults are there keeping everybody safe. But in that safety, we allow all sorts of things to happen. A uh, play is not about work or about outcomes. Uh, it's obviously not for real. In play, you can shake a baby. In play, you can pretend to die. In play, you can pretend that your mummy has died and it's not for real. Um, and it also is very expressive and exploratory. And it is generally characterized by a sense of freedom and enjoyment. We need to be a little bit careful because in education, we are focused often on outcomes and sometimes we interfere with the with the purpose of play. So we have to be very careful not to turn play into work because the focus in play is on the activity. It's not about how tall the tower is, it's about building a tower. Um, and it's very interesting because I was just I'm planning some sessions trying to help teachers of K-4 work online with children and it's going to be a challenge. And somebody innocently said, well, you know, you could you could get the children to play and then to take a picture of what they did. And I said, I thought, oh, it's a lovely idea to take a picture of what they did. But if they start building so that they can take a picture so they can show their teacher what they did, that is no longer play because it's now not about the activity. It's about the outcome. Um, play, it's the activity that engages, not whether you got it right or not. And the fun is in the activity, not in the outcome. Again, we sometimes just flip flop between those, but we need to be very, very careful that sometimes we just need to let kids do something for the sake of doing it, because that actually is what's necessary in terms of, of the, the, the importance of play. And I'll get that to that in a moment when I get down to the, to the importance of play. So play is about getting out of real life, a joy and delight and frames and settings to be explored. Ch children, have a lack of mixed feelings. Now, what we need to understand is that preschoolers do not have mixed thoughts and mixed feelings. They are not capable of saying, on the one hand, on the other hand, part of me feels this way, part of me feels that way. They just can't do that. Their brains actually are wired up to have only one feeling, one impulse, one thought at a time. It doesn't mean to say that they can't think about their friends. If their friend is feeling sad, it's very possible for a four-year-old or a five-year-old to say, oh, you're feeling sad. I'm so sorry you're feeling sad. They have complete empathy for the other child as long as it doesn't affect them. 
but if for example the other child took their car away you know or, or they took their car away from the other child and this is causing the emotions if they think that that car belongs to them they have no empathy for the other child and so in in that moment even though you might later on have a talk with the child about how important it is to share, how nice it is, how the other child will like them. And by the way, we spend incredible amounts of time in K4 and K5 talking about sharing. Usually by the end of K5, kids get what sharing is because the part of their brain, that prefrontal cortex that starts developing and doesn't really kick in until, until about five to seven years old, they then can think about their friend in the act of sharing as well as thinking of themselves, but it's not possible. Um, and so it's very, very important. Um, it's also in terms of emotions, it's meant that they need to find their dominant feeling. Uh, Four-year-olds, they are either spectacularly happy or spectacularly sad. You know, and again, many of you won't see this necessarily in the classroom because children sort of, um, for whatever reason, their emotions are a little bit dampened uh, in, in a, a setting where they maybe are just not feeling quite so sure about it. But boy, at home, do they ever have that. And if any of you have young children at home of a raised four-year-olds, four you know, I, I think of it, I call it the four-year-old birthday syndrome, where at the beginning of the birthday party, it's the most wonderful birthday party they've ever had. And I don't know how many four-year-old birthday parties I went to with my children, where by the end of the birthday party, the four-year-old is in complete sobbing tears and telling their parent it's the worst birthday that they've ever had, because they can only feel one emotion at a time. And it is preparing them to actually learn about their emotions. You can't learn about joy if you don't feel joy. You can't learn about sadness if you don't feel sadness. You can't learn about frustration. You can't experience that until you, uh, until you ex live that frustration. You have to live your emotions before they start registering to you as things that are distinct from each other. Anyway, it's a quite a complicated thing to become a human being, as you can tell. What we find is that it takes from five to seven years before the brain can start connecting different parts, the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere, the prefrontal cortex, the corpus callosum. This takes a long time to happen and four-year-olds are only in the early stages of that. Most five-year-olds are only really starting to do that and it doesn't kick in until six or seven years old. You know, and what we need to have here is our left hemisphere is where information comes in. Um, and again, it's very tempting in education to want to give children lots of details, lots of knowledge. Um, I know that we, you know, we want them to learn letters, we want them to learn numbers, we want to, them to learn these kinds of details. And those are important. But what we have to remember is that details are useless to us if we don't have a right hemisphere that has been well developed. The right hemisphere takes the details and makes them into some kind of a whole, puts them into a context, makes them vivid and concrete, takes in the whole picture. And so one of the, the problems that we're having is we don't understand that the right hemisphere is actually in rapid development during the preschool years. But it does not need information to develop, it needs experiences to develop. So one and, and where most of those experiences come from for children is in play. So it's really it, what ends up happening. And so those of you that have taught early, later grades, if you have a child whose right hemisphere is not well developed, they might even be able to learn how to read, uh, read a word, sound out words, read sentences, even read paragraphs. But sometimes, and it often happens around grade three, people will say, this child can read an entire paragraph, but they don't understand what they're reading. Well, if the right hemisphere of the brain has not been given a chance to fully develop, the capacity to understand and comprehend, to problem solve, is a whole lot less. And this is one of the reasons why I'm passionate about us understanding preschoolers is because if we try to teach them too much too early, they might learn the skill, but they won't get the whole picture. And so it's very, very important for us to give children lots and lots of time for play. Um, and when they're when they're not well integrated, of course, they're going to be Im impulsive, they're and untempered, and their emotions are not going to be balanced. But we have to remember that development cannot be forced, practiced, or pushed. And so what we end up here, and this is so fascinating, because these are some of the both the delightful things about the preschooler personality, um, 
that, that is non-integrated is they do have a purity of emotion and an innocent belief in magic. And just look at them right now. And again, it's a bit of a different year this year. But, you know, they go to the mall and they see a Santa at one mall who might, not, who might be quite tall and not all that heavy, not at all that round. And that's the real Santa. And then they go and they see another Santa who's kind of ch round and chubby and short, you know, and that's the real Santa because their brain can't even hold in their mind. Oh, well, that Santa is different from that Santa. Santa is Santa. They believe in magic. They're absolutely certain about what they're thinking. Um, they do tend to be impulsive. As I say, they're still desperately happy at the beginning of a, a birthday party and desperately sad at the end. They can't make a, a, a sacrifices towards a goal. They're not very reliable. They're going to promise you the earth, but they can't do it because they can't hold their promises in their mind when they're in the middle of a situation that causes them to act in another way. And they are terrible at problem solving. They can't take more than one factor into consideration at any given time. They have an integrity that's uncomplicated by diplomacy. They will say what they think. Why are you so fat? I think your hair is ugly. They don't even notice that they said that. They're sure that they are, their point of view is correct and they don't, it's not sullied by considerations of reality. They are single-mindedness. Um, they have a purity of action um, and they have egocentrism in, that is there. Um, and they definitely have a take on unfairness that is one-sided. But all of these things are necessary for growth and development. You need to be black and white before you can start to make gray. If we try to push children too quickly into being gray, then they don't get the two perspectives. They start getting it all mixed up and some of them actually get stuck in this personality profile. And you might know some adults that basically are all of these things, but not in a delightful kind of way. Brazen counter will, oh my goodness. This kind of ties into some of what I was just talking about. We have an instinct within us that really doesn't like us to uh, to push us around. Now, children, this instinct protects us against outside influence, those that are not within the parent section village of attachment, because not so much now, but in the olden days, communities and, and cultures had to teach children their way of doing things because their way of doing things assured them that they could survive in the climate into which they were born. So parents had to raise children very differently in northern Canada than they did in, southern, in the southern, um, southern climates. So we couldn't have other people influencing our children. And that instinct stays there. So one of the things that we find is that children by default don't like to be told what to do by people to whom they're not attached. And if you've ever been um, you know, a, a substitute teacher, you know this. So it's also very, very important that we have a good relationship between the teacher, the parent, and the school. Because if the child sees the school as being part of their village of attachment, they are much more likely to follow our lead and do what we ask them to do. Uh, again, I'm not so sure if it would be all that clear in a four-year-old, but many of you have had children come back and say to you, uh, perhaps around homework. My mom said I didn't have to do homework. Oops, the child is attached to the parent. The parent says you don't have to do homework. Now the relationship with the school and the teacher is broken because of that. And this count comes with this counter will, I don't have to do what you tell me to do. And kids will sometimes say that to you. They'll say that to you if you're a substitute teacher or sometimes if you're a special subject teacher or if you're a lunchtime monitor. I don't have to listen to you, you're not my teacher. That's the counter will instinct that basically is protecting the attachment with the people that they're attached to. And why do they oppose a child to a parent, to an adult to whom they are attached? Because, you know, for example, the teacher who sent that child home with homework, the teach the child might even have left at the end of the day and said, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to, yeah, I promise I'll do the homework. But if the parent said, oh, you don't have to do that stupid homework, boom, the attachment is broken. But especially with four-year-olds and early five-year-olds, they can only attach to one person or one thing at a time. So it's very important before we give children instructions and tell them to do things that we collect them. And again, most of you are magical about that. You have your ways, you have your songs, you have all sorts of things where you get the children to reattach to you and then 
you get their eyes, you get a nod and a smile, you give their direction, and they're willing to follow it. Sometimes, especially if a child has been really immersed in their play and they didn't hear the song that says it's the end of time, sometimes you'll get a child who won't want to stop playing simply because they didn't hear what you did in terms of collecting them and they're still attached to their play. The other thing which we need to understand, which is really, really important, is that for children to become separate in their functioning, they actually have to resist the will of others. And we see that particularly in the two to three-year-old stage and, and in the early four-year-old stages where they basically are going to not, you know, listen at all. They have their own agenda. They think it's nighttime. Um, I remember one little kid, you know, was saying to, to, to their parent, no, it's nighttime. I'm like, well, the sun was out. Well, the child was looking out the window where they saw the moon. So in their mind, it was nighttime, right? Because, and of course, it's important for us, and many of us understand that in two and three-year-olds, we let them, we give them as much leeway as we can in developing their own way of doing things. And of course, this kind of comes about again at adolescence. And what we often find is that as the child's sense of self grows, they now can accept more you know, other things, and they decide what works for them and what doesn't work for them. So it's really important that we work with this counter will instinct. Counter will is evoked by coercion, by pushing a child to do something they don't want to do. How do we help mitigate the counter will instinct? Well, we do it in three ways. One is we increase attachment. And so when a child, very often when we want a child to do something, and we tend to want to, you know, we say, no, it's time to stop playing. Actually, what I say to people is, yes, you say the words, it's time to stop playing, you mean what you say, but when the child looks up at you, we actually need to put attachment into our eyes. Ah, thank you for looking at me. And many of you do that naturally. Thank you for listening. Now it's time. And as soon as they're nodding and smiling at you, they're much more likely to follow. We can give them choices. You know, do you want to put that away for later on or do you want to just put it into the box that it belongs in? So that can help with the counter will instinct. And as many of you have found out, the more you need a child to do something, sometimes the more softly you need to speak. Because when we speak softly, it's less coercive. And some of you have found that. Like not these things, these things are not going to work with every child. We have some children who have a lot of difficulty, a lot of strong counter will in them. But actually, if we play with these, we can find that we can get children to do more of what we need them to do. What's really, really careful here, critical here is that we are actually wired as people who want to be teachers to have a really hard time with a child who says no to us. Because actually what we under, what we know is that if they won't follow us, we can't teach them. But we have to make sure that we keep our counter, our reactions to counter will in check. Because as you know, the more you try and push a child to do, the less they're going to want to do it. And when we get into a, a, a battle of the alpha instincts against the counter will instincts, unfortunately, children will often take the lead. So what we need to figure out is how we can stay in charge, even if we can't be in control. So if a child absolutely refuses, and we know that we're going to get into a major battle about this and have a major tantrum, and, and many of you know that what your worry is, is the other children are going to say, well, if I just say to them, okay, we'll do whatever you want, the other children will stop seeing me as a leader in the classroom. So it's important for us to find a way to stay in charge, even if we can't be in control. And I saw a wonderful teacher do this with a little girl who had spectacular meltdowns. And uh, we were trying to anyway, trying to help this little girl and she just wouldn't do it. And I finally said to the teacher, you're going to have to give her those toys that she wants to play with because do you want her to have a tantrum? And the teacher said, no, I'm not ready for a tantrum right now. I said, okay, well then you're going to have to give her the toys. And the teacher just looked at me like, you know, really these psychologists, because she knew that if she just said to the kid, okay, take the toys, that she would lose her role as the leader uh, with that child. And so I said, well, can, can you find a way to do it? And she kind of rolled her eyes again and walked over and got the toys and gave the toys to the little girl but oh my goodness she modeled for me the perfect thing about how to stay in charge even if you can't be in control and she said to the little girl I have decided that you may play with this toy and and the little all of a sudden she was the one that was in charge you can do that with your group maybe you're listening you're reading a story to the group and like more and more of them are getting antsy and they're not listening and they're rolling around on the ground um and they're just not listening and you realize oh my goodness you know if i start uh, honey sit down stop be quiet be quiet if i start it's going to take so much time to get control back into the group you know what you're just going to say 
Whew, I've read six pages already. Let's just get up and do something. And of course, we've just given a whole session on the importance of brain breaks, especially in this time right now when, when our children are, have much more frustration and alarm in them. And you know, you might say, yeah, but there's seven children that wanted to hear the rest of the story. Well, you know what? They aren't going to hear the rest of the story if you have to spend the next seven minutes trying to get the rest of the group calmed down. They enjoy, you have to do something that everybody enjoys, right? Something that's fun and then read the rest of the story tomorrow. Um, our, our children who are preschoolers also have a lot of aggression in them. And where does aggression come from? Well, it comes from frustration. Frustration is the experience of something not working. And oh my goodness, if we think about our four-year-olds and our five-year-olds, how many things do not work in their life? They have fingers that have a hard time buttoning things. They have fingers that have a hard time tying knots. They have so many things that don't work. Dr. Neufeld likes to present frustration as a traffic circle, things not working come in, but we have a number of ways out. Um, and of course, one of the things that we know is the most frustrating for our young children is separation or facing separation. Uh, attachment frustration is huge for our children. And of course, when they first have to leave home or when they have to leave their favorite daycare or wherever they are, this can cause additional frustration. So our, a lot of little guys are coming in with a lot of different kinds of frustration in their life. And when something isn't working, the first thing we do is try and change it. And many of these kids have begged, please, mommy, please, mommy, can I stay home? Um, but there's so many things that they can't. And we know that there's many things a young child cannot change. When you can't change something, you hit a wall of futility. And we all know that. We are all hitting our walls of futility at this moment in time. Because, because of the virus, we're not able to do even Christmas in the way that we're used to doing it. When you can't do something, when there's futility there, when you can't change it, no matter how much you try, the way out is through adaptation, through feelings of sadness, through but you can't feel sad unless you can tolerate vulnerability. And so sometimes in that moment, we can't actually feel our sadness. And if you, if you, it, sorry, I'm, if you, it, sometimes we can't feel it, but when we do feel it, the feelings of frustration need to turn to feelings of futility, or in the, in the words of, uh, of, of Sesame Street, mad needs to turn to sad. And when that happens, we actually can, we can deal with things. And I'm going to talk about a little bit more about adaptation in a moment. But when we can't feel that sadness, then we actually, all that energy moves around the traffic circle and it can go out through attack. Because frustration comes with cortisol and adrenaline, all the energy to try and change something that needs to be, to be, to be taken out through the tears of adaptation. And there's a lot of that energy now that comes into attack. Now it's meant to be tempered by mixed feelings to put us back into the traffic circle. But remember, our four-year-olds and our five-year-olds, many of them don't don't have that prefrontal cortex that can allow for mixed feelings. And so when they're lacking mixed feelings, they will actually come out and attack. Uh, now, some of your children kind of can hold it in. Um, I had a daughter whose frustration was held in by alarm, and so she kept in her frustrations until she got home and the attacking came out at home. So there is a little bit of a nuance here, but some of our children have so much frustration in their system, and they just can't. And it doesn't matter how many consequences they Get, how many times we try and talk to them about it, they just can't yet temper that. And remember, the tempering only puts us back into the traffic circle so we can find another way out. It's very important to help our children find another way out or another way through. This is why tears are so important. Our youngsters, our four-year-olds and our five-year-olds and even our six-year-olds, even us as adults, need to be able to feel our sadness so that we can we can, we can find another way through. Tears are a sign that we're moving into adaptation. When we are going through a maze and we can't, and we hit that wall of futility, in, before we can turn ourselves around, we actually need for that futility to sink in. And one of the signs that futility sinks in are tears. If we only understood how much our four-year-olds still needed to cry, we would actually 
restructure our whole classrooms and actually put another adult in there who would be the tear doula, the person who comes to take the tears. And I know some of you are in a classroom alone with four-year-olds. And, you know, if you're comforting a child who's crying, uh, there isn't anybody else to take care of the children. But if we truly understood this, we would have at least two, if not three people in our, in our K-4 classrooms. And we'd have a crying corner where children could go. When children are able to grieve what they cannot change and they have lots of grieving to do, then they become resourceful, then they become resilient, then they can recover from all the things that are happening in their life, but they need that time and space. Dr. McNamara gives some very word, wide, wild, wise words of, 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 uh, of wisdom in her book. She says, in young children, tears are the best indicator of an emotional system that is functioning well. When we communicate to our children that something is wrong with them for being sad, we actually stop the tears and we stop the opportunity for them to rest from that which they cannot change. Because you know there are some children that keep persisting, they keep trying to change things, they keep trying to get you to change their mind. And when they're doing that, their brain is not in rest and when their brain is not in rest, it cannot grow. One of the best gifts we can give our children is to value their sad tears and to make rooms for, room for them to flow. I don't have time today to talk about how to do that, but I have a whole system a ses session where I talk about the importance of sadness and how we can help children cry. And again, as a classroom teacher, you might not be the person who can do that, but hopefully there is someone in your school that can do that. When children are experiencing too much separation, too much alarm, too much shame, they actually put on a shell and that shell actually stops them from, from developing as they should. When tears dry up, maturation is slowed. Um, in many of the programs that I work in for children with severe behavior problems, I work particularly at St. Raphael School in, in English Montreal School Board, when they started working with this material and started understanding how important and critical tears were, they, and many of those children had not cried for years, but when the child started to cry in the comfort of, that, of the caring of the adults in that school, all of a sudden they started seeing huge growth and development in those children. And of course, what is needed for that is connection. Our little ones need so much connection. Um, in terms of their personality profile, they have a hunger for contact and connection. And it takes precedence over any other need. You know, um, and one of the things as well, what we need to remember is that for some of our children, this desire to, to connect and to stay connected with the adults means that they are going to do everything in their power to be good. And I actually have more concerns for a child who is good all day than for a child who loses it throughout the day, because it means to, says to me that they're actually spending a lot of time and energy trying to figure out how to please adults instead of actually being the kind of kid that they need to be. They, of course, because they are only four years old, they're very preoccupied with sameness and wanting to be like everybody else. They have a huge fear of separation. Um, that's why bedtime, darkness, getting lost, being forgotten, they even worry about being kidnapped or being left behind can get overwhelming for these kids. They are easily wounded to the quick by perceived signs of disapproval or not mattering. Um, they, of course, they love hide and seek because they want to be found, and of course, if you don't find them, it causes huge problems. And they have a huge need for togetherness that trumps all else. And as I mentioned, this entire intense desire for connection means that many of them will try everything they can to be good. What we need to understand is children don't need to separate to grow up. They rather need deep attachments for maturation to result. Attachment is like the roots that connect our children. If they have deep roots, they're going to grow and develop. And so we need to continue to make sure that they, they, that we stay attached, they stay attached to us as much as possible. They also need play. Play is huge, and especially now in the time of COVID where there's lots of emotions around, they need to be able to do what they need to do to help themselves emotionally. It's not only emotionally though, it's cognitively. True play programs the brain's problem-solving networks and the problem-solving networks are housed in that right hemisphere. And it's in playful activity, not stimulation or instruction that makes a positive difference in brain development. 
when people say to me, oh, this child comes from a home, there's not a lot of stimulation in the home. Children can play with thread, with spools, they can play with paper, they can play with, 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 with twigs. If they feel safe, they don't need a lot of stuff, but if they don't feel safe, they can have a room full of toys and not be able to play with them. And it's play that builds the brain that then allows them to receive instruction or solve problems. They shouldn't be asked to solve, they shouldn't be asked to solve problems at four years old. They should be given the materials in which their brain can figure out how to solve problems without any in, in, interference by us. And of course, where does this impressive brain growth happen in the context and connection? There's so many parts of the brain that have to connect together, so many parts. And what actually does that for our children is play. They learn, they, they, they become more effective students in, during the playtime than they do in any of the teaching time that we have with them. Uh, it's absolutely critical. Again, just to understand all the different kinds of play, there's emergent play, you know, where children are curious and exploring and, and, they, and they can form their own boundaries and figure out who they are and their interests are primed. They, they realize that, that what they do makes a difference and oh my goodness, I poured too much rice, I poured too much water, it overflowed. Um, they realize, oh, if I don't wanna make a mess on the floor. So all these kinds of things happen in the context of play. And it's a leap from dependence into viability as a separate being. This is kind of the gold standard of play. Many, many of our children don't have the luxury of engaging in, in emergent play because their play actually serves other needs as well. Their play, of course, in play, they talk about their attachment and it's so interesting. You don't even think of hide and seek and tag and chasing as, as having a role in terms of attachment. But, but when you're caught, you know, you feel like someone cares about you. Um, pretending to be is about attachment and children pretend to be the people that they're attached to. A gathering and collecting is about attachment. Facing separation and playing at disasters or death. Uh, even in, in play, you can play with counter will. You can play with alpha. You can play being the mom. You can play the dad. You can play being the child. You know, dependent play. Um, so play has many, many different roles. And really, um, what would be fascinating to me is just to watch all the different ways that children play, because the way that they play tells us what's important in their world. Of course, there's emotion-based play. Uh, and for children to, to be able to have their health in this day, we need to allow emotions to be expressed and work through play. When children are stirred up emotionally, their play can reflect the themes that they're struggling with. It allows them to express deep emotions safely. Many, many of our children right now are, are, are worried about people getting sick and people dying. But when they say to, the, you know, sometimes they say to their parents, mommy, I'm scared that you're gonna die. And that upsets the parent and children, oh my goodness, they, they don't wanna talk to their parents about it, but they can actually do it in their play. Because in play, pictures are drawn, structures are made, games are engaged and emotions come to the for, through play, through drawings, through different ways. Um, we used to be get very, people get very distressed when children draw pictures of violence. But actually what those pictures are telling us is a child isn't feeling safe in their world or they're full of frustration. So when we see pictures of violence, rather than telling a child to not do that, what that should cue us is, oh, we need to work even harder at making this child feel safe. So they play at alarm, they play with monsters, being the monsters, ambush games, pretending to be scared, scary stories one step removed. There's lots of alarm in our system right now and I watched a wonderful kindergarten child teacher playing with her children about alarm. She pretended to be the monster and she would come and get them and the children would all scream and run away. Of course, again, she had to monitor which are the children that can handle that kind of play. A very, very sensitive child might not be able to do that. That child might need to go out somewhere else. But a lot of kids, as long as it's a teacher that they love, as long as the teacher can modulate it, they actually it regulates it and calibrates their alarm system. And of course, a lot of our kids are going to be playing COVID right now. And they're also going to be playing dead. They're going to be playing the orphan. They're going to be wanting fairy tales where children are lost or face separation and are found. Okay, so these are important things. So don't get distressed, especially in this day and age, if kids are playing these things, because basically they're playing through what they're living emotionally. Frustration at play. This is really fascinating because, okay, there's so many things that don't work in a child's life. 
interestingly, we don't realize that by giving them things like blocks and Lego, we're actually helping their frustration because it, they can make something work. They can make something perfect. They can orchestrate things in their play um, that uh, actually helps them to feel as if they've got control over their world. So construction play is incredibly important for emotional well-being. And then, of course, they also play out and, and you'll see that in your, you know, your, especially your boys will often do things like they'll, they, they will build something, but they love watching it fall down. They're, you know, when they go out at recess time, they're going to throw things and hit things and kick things and scream because through play, they can let out that attacking energy, play fighting and more and more starting to realize that we shouldn't stop play fighting. We just need to monitor it so that nobody gets hurt. But even if they get hurt, we don't say, no, you can't play fight because you got hurt. There are a few children who have so much frustration inside of them. We do need to monitor a lot, but most of the time they don't do it on purpose. And in schools where they've allowed more play fighting to happen, and they did that at St. Raphael, they actually found that there was less aggression. So this natural desire for war games and attacking games actually help to keep that attack in the real world out because they do it through play. One of the things we need to realize around play is that despite early literacy programs for preschoolers in the UK, children's reading skills are some of the lowest in Europe. This research was done in 2003. I'm sure there's more research around. Um, we just have to be so careful because if you learn to read and write earlier, it does not mean to say that you're going to be a better student. In Finland, no teacher is expected children to learn how to read and write before they're eight years old. And Finnish children, by the time they're 10, are leading academically everywhere. It's not how early you teach them to read and write that's going to make a difference. And a lot of kids, when there's a lot of pressure put on academics, actually become more anxious. And again, there's a lot more of this research around. We have to be so careful not to delight in academic performance too early. So I know I have about 10 minutes left and uh, um, I have a lot more things that I want to share with you and I'm sure people have lots and lots of questions. Um, but I just wanted to share a few things around how to work with our little four-year-olds, especially how can we you know, work with them and help them and make them get, help them make it through the day. And most of you do this naturally. You already do that. But I just want to highlight a few little things that, that you need to keep remembering, right? So it's, it's called a developmentally friendly discipline for the immature. And the first one is impose order rather than trying to teach behavior. You know, um, use structure and routine to orchestrate behavior, be proactive to prevent problems. Don't again, try and teach children and get them to manage their own behavior, just be a traffic director. Be minimally reactive, just enough to intervene with the situation and avoid talking too much about behavior. Again, talking engages the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere is still not quite ready to, 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 to put into action the things that they might necessarily know. So in terms of imposing order, again, most of you are doing this. And again, because of COVID, we're doing it even more. And interestingly enough, a lot of schools had told me that the beginning of the year went way better than they thought. And the reason it went better than they thought is because they did things that we didn't used to do before. I mean, you know, it, it just simple things like keeping children out of each other's way. Well, when we got them to line up initially, we put nature that there were, there was the spacing for six, you know, three meters or whatever, and we stopped doing that. But many of you know, at, at circle time, things like carpet swatches or chairs or masking tape can help children figure out how to stay in their own spot, right? Carpet time, we think it, you know, it should be so easy for kids to do, but many of them don't know where their boundaries are. But the beauty about carpet swatches is you can pull them out and separate them. I had one kindergarten group that it was, there were many, many factors in this. They couldn't handle carpet time at all. And for a whole bunch of different reasons, we said, you know what, let's just give each children, let's make carpet time happen, but not on the carpet, but in chairs, because it was easier for a child to know where their chair was and where it wasn't. You know, and again, masking tape can come, sometimes do that. And the same thing with lining up and at arm's length. You know, again, we've done this with COVID and it's been so helpful to all of our kids, let alone our little ones. Let the environment do the guiding. Use photos. 
what it should look like when it's done. Okay, we want them to pile up their carpets. Let's put a photo there so they know what piling up means and what it's supposed to look like. It's not going to help every kid, but it's going to help some of them. And many of them, when they say, oh, that's what they want to do, and away they go, they're piling it up. Where items should go, and many of you already do this. You know, and I would not only put the picture of the toy that's supposed to go in the bucket on the bucket this way, but when they pull the bucket out, I'd have a picture of the Lego and the balls and the, and the dinosaurs on the bottom of the bucket. So when they look in the bucket, they remember which toy is supposed to go in the bucket and of course practice 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 um, you know some for some children you might actually have to take them apart and say oh well let's you know when you throw some toys on the ground okay now show me how you're supposed to put it away not when they're excited about playing with it but when they're actually we're just trying to help them to figure out and to remember what to do obviously creating predictability and creating habits practice expected behaviors make it fun you know again with a little guy who's maybe having a hard time remembering where to put the toys and how to clean up clean up after playtime you know just say oh well let's let's pretend we're you know you know we're the we're the clown and the clown is let's show the clown where to put stuff as i say practice practice and uh, some of you if you have play five i don't think they do that in k4 but in k5 we teach children how to do things with lots of practice. And of course, the ideal one for kindergarten, songs to guide transitions. You know, getting the children's attention without raising our voice by, by having them do something that's incompatible. So if they're talking to each other, well, the alternate behavior, if you're singing, you can't be talking and you just need to get kids singing louder or doing a chant or doing silly gestures. Everything that we can do to detach them from playing and attach them to us, we've got a big smile on our face now they're looking at us, now they're nodding and smiling, and now we say, time to put the toys away. Now let's go find our buckets, and away we go. And so basically, you know, we, we're going to get them to do what we want them to do in a fun kind of way. Sadly, when we have to raise our voice, we've already, um, it just really isn't going to be that helpful in getting children to do what we want them to do. The, the gold standard is collect before you direct. Get into the child's space get their eyes, get a smile, get some kind of a nod. And in that moment, when their attachment instincts are engaged, they are going to want to do what you want them to do. But just remember, four-year-old's attachment, or immature children's attachment can break very quickly. It can take something as little as a bell ringing. In the minute that the, before the bell rings, they're saying they're promising you they will do whatever you want them to do. The bell rings, they look away, you look away, the attachment breaks. Now you give them a direction. Now it's time to come in, honey. I'm not doing that, you're stupid, because the attachment was broken in that moment. We need to remember with these little ones that we need to prioritize attachment. We need to make it unconditional. They're not meant to have to work uh, for attachment. When they're not growing, when they're working, they're not growing. We shouldn't be making them earn attachment as a reward. We should bridge the problems, problem behaviors. It was a hard day today, honey. It's okay. We need to let children know we're going to be there for them no matter what. And we need to provide more attachment when behavior is added. It's worst. I know this seems counterintuitive. People will say, but why are you being so kind to him? He's just, you know, you're just going to be reinforcing his bad behaviors. But we need to remember, even as adults, when we have a really bad day, even though our spouse might have known that we left the house in a grumpy mood and that we probably were grumpy all day, and that's probably people were grumpy with us. When we get home at night, we don't want our spouse telling us, honey, you were grumpy when you left this morning. What you, we want our spouse to do is to say, oh my goodness, poor you here, have a glass of wine, have an extra, I've, I've just warmed up the pizza. Re, being kind to children does not actually reinforce their bad behaviors. We need as the alpha to, to read the need and take the lead. We, some, as I mentioned before, if you can't be in charge, if you can't be in, in control, stay in charge. Be the one that says, I've decided, let's do that. Um, and yes, sometimes we can take it, you know, there are some children that just can't play with the blocks because if they play with the blocks, the blocks are going to get thrown and if the blocks get thrown, someone's going to get hurt. But maybe we can give give them full blocks that are soft, right? So we as the adult can decide what a child can do, but not as a consequence, but because it's in their best interest. Um, I set up a classroom for four-year-olds at St. Raphael. These were kids who had been who'd been sent away from regular kindergartens because they just couldn't handle it. And the first thing I said to the kindergarten teacher, there will be nothing in your classroom for the first month that if it's thrown could hurt anybody because we want, we don't want these children to get into trouble again. And she did it and it was amazing. 
when they are having challenging behaviors, we need to say, well, what's going on underneath? Is there extra frustration? Are they particularly immature? Have they had some really, are, you know, are they in foster care? These we call adverse childhood experiences. Where is this coming from? Where is the attachment frustration coming from? Where is the immaturity coming from? And when we get frequently get into trouble, how can we keep them out of trouble? We actually need to control the situation and the circumstances. Is it at recess time? Is it in the hallways? Is it in the bathrooms? You know, is it in the lunchroom? And again, these are all things maybe are a bit different in COVID times than it was before. But even sometimes the classroom is too noisy. Is it with a substitute teacher? Um, I know that in one of our kindergarten classes, we had a little kid who couldn't handle substitute teacher. Well, we found somebody else. And I know this is hard in COVID times because you can't be putting kids from one bubble into another. But maybe this particular child could go to a classroom where there's a sibling um, and, and could be taken care of by somebody else because they just can't handle the substitute teacher. We need to anticipate and prevent as much as possible. This is what I mean by being a traffic director. We, we keep the kid out of trouble rather than giving them a consequence for trouble. We need to be aware of the fact that we think we need to correct every problem in the moment. If we understand and children from a developmental perspective, we know that by the time they get close to six years old, they will spontaneously be able to share. We shouldn't worry at four years old that they can't share. We shouldn't worry at four years old that they there's so many things they can't do. By the time they get to be five or six, it will start to get in developmentally and it's quite exhausting if we try and change I watched a wonderful young man who became a kindergarten teacher he had actually worked in my adolescent program and he understood development and he understood he was very kind to the children when they were in acting inappropriately he just separated them and spoke to them very kindly I said to him I'm exhausted just listening to how much you're speaking and he said, yes, but I'm trying to explain to them what their behavior is. I said, you've already explained it. I know you've already explained it. All I'm seeing are these little kids. And of course, they were all madly in love with him because he was such a lovely young man. And they're just looking at you. And I can see in their eyes, they're just saying, please, Mr. Jeff, please don't like, don't stop liking me. And I said, they can't hear a word that you're saying in that moment. Because very often what they were doing wasn't because they didn't know better. It was just because they were immature or they, their, their frustration came out. You know, maturation, not learning in the moment is what's going to ultimately resolve these issues. I said, talk to them once in a while about how they can do, do things differently. And the rest of the time, just act. Don't explain it. Just just separate them, just move one here, move one there, but don't keep talking at them because they aren't learning and you're exhausting yourself. Um, I, I see that we're running out of time. So I, um, I, I don't know if, I'm, if I have a couple of minutes to just do this. Um, maybe what we can do actually, you know what, I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to uh, leave this be. And maybe what we can do is plan another session for uh, some of the things that I'm doing here because um, again, I, I have a lot of practices, disciplinary practices that I think um, I want to spend more time doing. So maybe I can do that. Um, I am going, so I'm just going to jump over this and just come to the, come to the end here and say, you know what, good development requires patience, patience and faith. There is a difference between a child who acts mature and a child who's given time to become mature. And we need to have faith in that. We can train children to do things a lot at early stages, but we shouldn't mistake this for maturity. You know, children, children, maturity takes a long time. And just because they're good, I often say good is not all that it's cracked up to be. Final thoughts that I have are basically play, make sure there's lots of time for play. When all when things are not going well in the day, when your, your schedule has, has to change, don't take play time away if you can. Do lots of singing, do lots of dancing, uh, do lots of you know sharing of emotion, provide comfort as best you can under the circumstances, create lots of time for rest, provide generously, forgive easily, feel your sadness about all the things that didn't work right, because if you can feel your sadness, you'll find a way through for the next day and have faith in nature's plan. Um, we do have some things on our, our website, um, cbm.ca, and I'm hoping in the next few months to have a particular corner for our, for, for our young children, um, but do visit our website. So I'm going to stop sharing, and I know that I've gone through huge amounts of information, um, but I am willing to stay for a couple of extra minutes for any questions uh, that you might have. And um, 
I, and as well, I think I'm quite happy, um, uh, Joelle, and by the way, you guys can come back up again, uh, Joelle. And